BBOR Black Box Online Radio coming to you from West Virginia. Black Box Ned 88 on Instagram for the bonus podcast. And welcome to BBOR, the home of True Crime Talk Radio and your premier destination for unsolved mysteries, criminal psychology, and exploring the dark side of cyberspace. My name is Ned DeHaan, and I am your host as well as the creator of Astro Psych 400 here on YouTube, and regular contributor to the Zodiac Killer channel. And a great way to support these shows is just by listening to some more content. But you can also go over to Amazon.com and have a look at the book Killer on a White Horse, written by me, Ned Dahan. It is a novel, murder mystery, inspired by the Zodiac Manson connection, but it is indeed fictional. However, who doesn't love a good mystery? And there is always the Teespring page. Feel free to check out some of the merchandise. And remember, being weird is not a crime. Let the show begin. Okay, hello everybody, and welcome to this special weekend episode of Black Box Online Radio. The reason why this episode is coming out on a Sunday is because on the weekends I do a regular segment about the murder of Sean Benet Ramsey from 1996. And recently I've been doing a book discussion on the Death of Innocence, which was written by Sean Benet's parents, John and Patsy Ramsey. But that segment was originally launched because I was reading a different book about the case, and it was presumed guilty by Stephen Singular. And I have this very bad habit of reading multiple books at the same time. Sometimes I'll even read five, six, seven, eight books at once. And I used to say, that's why I never finish any of them. And I've been getting better at finishing the books lately. That I guess it's because I discuss them with you guys here on Black Box Online Radio. But I wanted to give Stephen Singular's book, Presumed Guilty, another chance. Because he's talking about the murder of Jean Benet Ramsey and some connections to the pornographic industry. And there are some parts of this book, though, that I found to be somewhat disappointing, but in this episode you'll see how it got my attention in a particular way. In a previous episode, I was critical of Stephen Singular for talking about a story that seemed not super relevant to the Jean Benet Ramsey case, and I'll just read you one quotation from the book. In the spring of 1997, Jeremy Strohmeyer, an 18-year-old alleged developer of Internet CP, CP is something bad to children involving images, an Internet developer of CP followed a seven-year-old girl into a Las Vegas casino restroom, then raped and murdered her while her father gambled. I read that off in a previous episode, and I was saying, well, that sounds like an absolutely terrible story, but I didn't quite see how it was connected to the Jean Benet case, and you can take that for what you will. But I encountered another sentence in the book, and it just simply says, In some cases, the hurt would not only be virtual. In October of 1996, a Maryland woman was found murdered behind the home of a man she had met online. And that was just the end of it. That was the end discussion, full stop. And I began to think, well, I have to know more about that. Do you ever just have those moments when you hear a little bit of the story, like you hear a fragment of the story, and you want to know more about it. And I got online and I decided to see, firstly, how hard would it be to find this exact story. And because I've talked to you guys about true crime cases here on Black Box Online Radio, I was expecting that it wouldn't take too much work to find out what story was he talking about. Because, again, very, very vague statement. Just a woman met a man online, and she was found murdered behind his home. And number one, I also don't see how that's exactly connected to the Jean Benet Ramsey case, other than trying to say that there's this um, explosion of internet crime in 1996, the same year that Jean Benet was murdered, and could, have there been, could there have been some type of internet pornographic reason connected to her death? But I was able to find the story, and it is dealing with the killing of Sharon Lopatka, L-O-P-A-T-K-A, Sharon Lopatka. And I'm not going to give the most research-heavy presentation on this, but I wanted to discuss this because, firstly, I think that there are a lot of conceptions that people had back in 1996 that maybe wouldn't stand up too well now. 
Sharon Lepotka was born on September 20th of 1961, and she passed away on October 16th of 1996. She was an internet entrepreneur in Hampstead, Maryland, who was killed in a case of apparent consensual homicide. And I don't talk about consensual homicide too frequently on this channel. Back in 2019, I did one episode on the story of Der Metzgermeister, the story of a man who responded to an ad on the internet and he went to another man's home and they cut off his penis and they ate it together and he actually died from the blood loss. It's um, also referred to as the penis-eating cannibal story. I mean, these stories are terrible, they're horrific, they're gruesome, but they're also true stories that are often neglected by other people. Some people would simply be afraid to read up on this part of human nature, but I know that if you've listened this far to the episode, you are not afraid to listen to um, what human beings are actually doing behind closed doors. And if you want to support this channel, you can hit the like button, subscribe, leave a comment in the section down below, visit some links in the description box, lots of ways to help out the channel, but I'll get back to the post here. Lepotka was tortured and strangled to death on October 16th of 1996 by Robert Frederick Glass, also known as Bobby Glass, a computer analyst from North Carolina. The apparent purpose was mutual sexual gratification. The case was reportedly the first where a police department arrested a murder suspect with evidence gathered primarily from email messages. While Lepotka and Glass had initially planned a consensual homicide, Glass maintained that the death was an accident, which was corroborated by Lopatka's autopsy. However, police contended that the death was intentional. All right, well, I'm going to give you a little bit of a spoiler, which we will see in very early on. But just to get right to the chase, they discussed this via email that she stated very clearly that she, Sharon, wanted him to torture her to death. She said that that was um, something that she wanted him to do to her. Consensual homicide. She asked for it to be done. And I'll share some observations about that later on. But here's some background. Sharon Lepotka was the first of four daughters born to parents Mr. and Mrs. Abraham J. Denberg, and she was raised in Baltimore, Maryland. She was allegedly considered by her classmates to be as normal as you can get, wrote the News and Observer, and was part of a sports team and a school choir club. She graduated from Pikesville High School in 1979, and Sharon Lopatka married a construction worker named Victor Lopatka, hence her uh, last name, and relocated to a ranch-esque tract home in Hampstead, Maryland. The marriage was described by a classmate as a way of breaking away, and her parents did not approve of it. And this might sound a little bit weird to some of you guys, but the absolute first thing that I thought about was Sharon Lopatka has married a man that she was more or less using to rebel against her parents with, so said this one friend. And yet she's emailing another guy about bizarre sex acts, including torturous acts, and even asking him to torture her to death. And the first thing I thought about was the movie Nocturnal Animals with Jake Gyllenhaal, and it's about that very concept, not the torture sex part, just about how a woman can be using a man for the sole reason of rebelling against her parents. She's marrying this guy because her mother doesn't approve of him and all of the chaos that follows after that. Of course, this real-life story of Sharon Lopatka is much more intense than that film. In 1995, Sharon Lepotka started doing an online advertising business from her Ellicott City home in order to make additional money. The website she hosted was called House of Dion, and it was about selling home decor guides by mail for $7. An advertisement on the website read, Home decorating secrets seen in the posh homes from the New England states to the Hollywood homes can now be yours. Never published before, quick, easy ways to decorate your homes. She was paid $50 per advertisement for rewriting ad copies, and her business was called Classified Concepts. So it's not, that sounds like a different type of business. She managed several websites, even one about psychic readings, and also garnering a percentage of money from the sales of other services with premium rate telephone numbers advertised on her websites. Premium rate telephone numbers. Wow, that really was the Stone Age. I do remember those as well. Now, I, I also have to throw in an interjection here. Why wasn't that enough? Why wasn't that sufficient? Okay, she's already gotten away from her parents that she doesn't seem to get along with. Why couldn't she have just left it at that and been some type of internet 
entrepreneur. Why couldn't she have just found some type of joy in earning money from the internet, even if she isn't completely self-sufficient and she isn't completely self-made and it's not a million-dollar business and she's still with her husband and he's running his construction business. But it sounds like she's doing many different internet projects and they're somewhat profitable for a lot of people. Yeah, they have problems with their parents and they just leave it at that. And I think that one point that you might be zoning in on very clearly would be that she must have been somewhat deranged, in some type of deranged mental state if she's going to not only think about these types of actions, but actually try to get in touch with a man who is going to torture her to death. But that comes to the next part where the internet business begins to escalate. So the next thing that she does is she starts marketing pornographic content using the name Nancy Carlson, that's an alias, which depicted women who were unconscious and being drugged, hypnotized, or chloroformed, and engaging in sex acts with each other. She sold her undergarments, an advertisement for them reading, Is there anyone out there interested in buying my worn panties? She also used the internet to fulfill her own sexual desires. They were often considered too irregular for society. And this is where I think there is somewhat of a split, because on the one hand, I would expect back in 1996, a lot of people probably could not comprehend why a woman would want to go through with all of these actions on her own choice, on her own free will. On the other hand, there are going to be the Freudian psychologists out there that will say, oh, well, she hated her parents, probably especially her father, and that's just what it is. It's just the manifestation of the hatred for one's parents coming out in bizarre sex acts in adulthood. And then there will be the third camp that is simply going to say, it's not as weird as you think. Yes, women are involved with pornographic activities from time to time, and some of them do it voluntarily, and some of them do it by their own free will. And women think in certain ways that some people just can't comprehend. Yes, women think about sex too, and they also find profitable ways. I mean, we have this thing called OnlyFans now, and this was a precursor to that, so it seems. But this is actually way more extreme than OnlyFans, and it's not only because she ended up dead because of her um, particular uh, desires, but also she's talking about things like fetish feet, sex bondage, necrophilia, sadomasochism, and even the fact that she's trying to include pornographic images of what sounds like rape, knocking women out with chloroform, and then men are engaging with sex in sex acts with them. Uh, so, as I said, she must have had some type of deranged issue going on. Lepotka's character of Carlson was a disciplinary and dominatrix movie actress, and this alarmed sex workers' rights activists, especially one named Tanith, who tried to stop Lepotka's behavior. Lepotka replied by saying, I want the real thing. I did not ask for your preaching to me. Bobby Glass worked as a computer analyst for the government of Catawba, North Carolina, for nearly 16 years. His tasks included programming tax rolls and keeping track of vehicle gas consumption for the county. For 14 years until May of 1996, Glass was married to his wife, Sherry, and the couple had two daughters and one son. Later during the marriage, Sherry noticed that her husband was spending too much time on the computer, and even more time on the computer than with her. Wary, she logged into his email account and found several raw, violent, and disturbing messages that he sent using the pseudonyms Toy Man and Slow Hand. Here's another reason why people look into the true crime world. There's this guy on the internet who's developing these personas, Toy Man and Slow Hand. And that sounds like a bad Hollywood movie. One that would not do well at the box office. It would be a flop. Then 20 years later, people would find some interest in it, like the story of Slow Hand. And maybe they're going to make a TV spinoff and a rebirth and a reboot and a recreation. I, I mean, this stuff sounds almost even more horrific than what they would actually put in the movies. Toy Man, though, I think is actually a real character in the uh, comic universe. Through email, though, Lepotka presented her fetish of being tortured to Glass while sent messages about how he would fulfill her fantasy. Close to 900 pages of emails between the two were discovered by police during the investigation of Lepotka's death. On the morning of October 13, 1996, Lopatka informed her husband that she was going to Georgia to meet acquaintances. She left him a note that said she would not be returning home and requested not to track down glass. The note also read, If my body is never retrieved, don't worry. Know that I am at peace. 
That morning, Lopaka drove her blue Honda Civic to Baltimore's Pennsylvania Station, a 45-minute drive, and it arrived on an Amtrak train at Charlotte, North Carolina by 8.45 p.m. Glass drove with Lopaka in his pickup truck to his rural North Carolina mobile home, 80 miles from Charlotte. Lopaka's husband, Victor, found the note his wife left him, who, and then found six weeks of email conversations with assistance from the police between Lopatka and Glass. In her email correspondence with Glass, Lopatka had explicitly asked Glass to torture her to death. Glass interview was interviewed later during his imprisonment, and he admi admitted to fulfilling Lopatka's torture fantasy, but also said that the death was an accident. Now, there are two sides of this. My immediate first instinct, and I repeat it's an instinct, was... Did this guy think that he would not be charged with murder or manslaughter or culpable homicide if he had these emails where she stated that she wanted it voluntarily? Did he think that he was going to get away with that or that did he think that perhaps he wasn't breaking the law? His own statement would state that this is actually a quotation. I don't know how much I pulled the rope. I never wanted to kill her, but she ended up dead, meaning that she was uh, murdered. She was killed by some type of asphyxiation. Of course, the police were left in the situation of having these emails that stated that she had asked him to torture her to death. Then the medical examiner says that the death seemed to be a type of accident and it was consistent with accidental strangulation. I mean, it really is quite unclear what exactly was going through that guy's mind, uh, Bobby Glass's mind, when he was committing the action, and I think those are sort of some, some things that we will never know, but I know what the police were most likely thinking. They're just looking at the hard facts. She had asked him to torture her to death. She had directly asked him, and you can see how her deviant behavior is escalating, and there's this type of blending between fantasy and reality, and I know that this is perhaps not the best time in the episode to interject with this, but I am reminded of a quotation from Sierra Pine, who said that you can think anything, you can imagine anything, you can daydream anything, as long as you recognize that it belongs in fantasy world, not in reality. And that's somewhat of a controversial statement, because not everybody would agree with that. But most of the time, I do agree with that exact statement, though. However, this goes well beyond fantasy and daydreaming because there was actually a real plan that was not only put into action that was not only requesting the help of an accomplice but the fact that Sharon Lapotka traveled and to meet this guy she wasn't even just talking about it I mean I think that there's even a difference between saying that she has this fantasy let's say hypothetically she has this fantasy of being tortured to death, and she's emailing the guy about saying, I want you to torture me to death. That is even not on the same par of getting on a train and going to meet the guy and getting in his pickup truck and then encouraging him to actually do it. I mean, there's a difference between talking about something and then actually committing the action. So says me anyway. In addition, though, getting back to the post, they found the drug and bondage equipment and magazines containing sexual exploitation material. Absolutely terrible. A three fifty seven Magnum pistol and several computer discs, as well as trash and toys outside the trailer. A police officer then noticed a mound of soil 75 feet away from the home before finding some body parts buried two and a half feet below. Glass was arrested at work following the discovery and charged with first-degree murder and held without bond in the Caldwell County Jail. Glass also faced additional state and federal charges for the possession of sexually exploitation material. And that one, I mean, if he's even in the possession of child pornography, yes, he should have been, should have been locked up. I mean, the death of Sharon Lepotka is somewhat questionable about whether he intended to actually kill her or not, and with murder you have to prove intent. But if he is even holding on to CP, I mean... I've already said it before, so child pornography, he should definitely have been behind bars. But Glass entered a plea of guilty to voluntary manslaughter and the sexual exploitation charges on January 27th of 2000 and was sentenced to 36 to 53 months in the Avery Mitchell Correctional Institution. He was also sentenced to an additional 27 months for federal charges of second-degree minor exploitation to be conserved consecutively. Glass was found dead of a heart attack 
on February 20th of 2002, one month before he was to finish his state sentence and begin his federal sentence. The Lopatka case was reportedly the first where a murder suspect was put into custody by the police mainly due to evidence from emails. So believe it or not, I do comprehend why Stephen Singular chose to include that in his book, Presumed Guilty, which is about the Jean Benet Ramsey murder. I mean, it's, it's an example of how the internet and the true crime world begin, began to coincide and how the paper trails were not only paper trails, but also electronic email trails that have been left behind. And I follow that type of thinking. But as I said, he did not include any specific details about the case. And there was actually a sentence that I did not read from that post, which stated that um, if the body of Sharon Lepotka had been buried in the Carolina woods, she may never have been found, and then Bobby Glass could have, could have gotten off the hook. But he buried her body 75 feet from the trailer, so they found her body rather easily. But yes, that is definitely the case that St Stephen Singular was talking about in his book, Presumed Guilty. My overall conclusion of this is that this um, is a case of mental health issues, psychological issues, and some type of twisted, self-loathing, self-abusive behavior that Sharon Lepotka had. And she definitely doesn't seem like someone who was of a sound state of mind if she's going to be getting on the internet asking somebody to torture her to death and that she found a willing accomplice and participant who most likely thought that he wasn't going to be punished for the crime but also bear in mind that that guy was deranged in his own way holding on to um, pornographic material involving children it sounds like he also had bizarre sexual habits and tendencies that he wasn't making very public. And because of the internet, they thought that they were able to share these types of twisted sexual um, stories of ideation and that they would be able to connect with each other and, again, not be punished for it. But I think that they're, even though every everything, after everything that I've said, there's still somewhat of a shocking element as to how Sharon Lopatka would have put this into action. Even after everything I've said, I'm still somewhat shocked that a woman would stage all of these things. And I know I've talked about how, yes, um, I mean, women have ideas that are rather similar to what um, men would have, or that the general public's conception of what women must be thinking about isn't always correct. But I found the story to be rather shocking. And I just wanted to respond to that here on Black Box All Night Radio. But do you have any comments about the death of Sharon Lepotka? Originally, um, it was the murder of Sharon Lepotka. The charges were dropped to manslaughter. And in all seriousness, um, I'm not surprised at all by the sentencing about how he, was, um, he wasn't sentenced to longer in, in prison. Bobby Glass, that is. I can comprehend why they sentenced him only to um, several years for the death of Sharon Lepotka and several years for the uh, pornographic material. But if you have any responses at all, you can put your ideas in the comments section down below. I wasn't intending to do the um, biggest presentation on this, and I was citing the Wikipedia article, but it was just some information that I thought was, well, a new story from the true crime world that I had not heard before, and a rather shocking one all the same. Please share anything you want in the comments section down below. Anybody can write the show at blackboxonlineradio at AOL.com. You can also get me on Facebook. My personal Facebook is in the description box. And there is always blackboxnid88 over on Instagram. And I will see you there for the bonus podcast. Until next time.